we have one of the central ministers participating with us in next few minutes through a video uh, the discussion is on making india the skills capital of the world uh, over the last 12 hours or so i'm sure all of us have heard heard multiple mentions about the importance of investment in youth uh, access and affordability to skilling the future of jobs and many such undercurrents or thematic areas being touched upon by various people today in a few minutes we'll hear from the honorable central union minister for the ministry of skill development and entrepreneurship himself dr mahendranath pandey may I request akshay to play his video and message to all of us who are tuning in over to you akshay इस कार्यक्रम में उपस्थित समस्त अतिथिगणों उद्योग जगत के समस्त बंधु नीति निर्धारकों पैनल वक्ताओं मीडिया के समस्त बंधुओं आप सभी को मेरा सर्वप्रेम नमस्कार मुझे प्रसन्नता है कि आज के इस महत्वपूर्ण अवसर पर मुझे भी सम्मिलित होने का अवसर मिला है जैसा कि हम सभी जानते हैं कोविड नाइन्टीन ने विश्व स्तर पर अर्थव्यवस्था को नुकसान पहुँचाया है इससे उभरने के लिए विश्व स्तर पर सभी अपने अपने उद्योगों के विकास और मांग को बढ़ाने के लिए पूरा प्रयास कर रहे हैं इसी क्रम में हमारे आदरणीय प्रधानमंत्री श्री नरेंद्र मोदी जी ने भारत की अर्थव्यवस्था को आगे बढ़ाने के लिए आत्मनिर्भर भारत का एक महामंत्र दिया है जो भारत की कुशल कार्यबल की उपलब्धता पर निर्भर है भारत को विश्व की कौशल राजधानी बनाने के उद्देश्य से हमारे माननीय प्रधानमंत्री श्री नरेंद्र मोदी जी ने 15 जुलाई 2015 को विश्व युवा कौशल दिवस के मौके पर स्किल इंडिया मिशन की शुरुआत की थी स्किल इंडिया मिशन का उद्देश्य सिर्फ नौकरियों के लिए किसी को तैयार करना मात्र नहीं बल्कि औपचारिक कौशल के लिए वहन की गई सामाजिक आर्थिक गतिशीलता के साथ उन्हें सशक्त बनाना भी है हमारे युवाओं को सशक्त बनाने के लिए हमारा स्किल इंडिया कार्यक्रम देश के कौशल विकास की जरूरतों को पूरा कर रहा है स्किल इंडिया मिशन के द्वारा हम राष्ट्र के आर्थिक विकास को नई गति निरंतर प्रदान कर रहे हैं एक मिशन ही नहीं बल्कि भारत को आर्थिक पथ पर दुनिया में आगे बढ़ाने वाला एक आंदोलन है स्किल इंडिया मिशन के द्वारा ही हम आत्मनिर्भर भारत की एक मजबूत नींव खड़ी कर रहे हैं इस मुश्किल समय में आईटीआई टी एवं जैसे संस्थान पूरी प्रतिबद्धता के साथ अपनी रिसर्च और इनोवेशन के माध्यम से कोरोना के खिलाफ अपनी जंग में अहम भूमिका निभा रहे हैं आई टी आई बहमपुर ने यूबीसी सैनिटाइजर आई कटक ने ऑटोमेटिक सैनिटाइजर जैसे डिस्पेंसिंग मशीन बहुत ही योग्य उदाहरण के साथ विकसित किए इसके साथ साथ जैसे अन्य संस्थाओं ने विशेष प्रकार के रोबर्ट स्वचालित सैनिटाइजर मशीन पीपी की मास्क आदि का भी बड़े पैमाने पर निर्माण किया है कोविड 19 के इस मुश्किल दौर में अब तक हमारी संस्थाओं के सहयोग से लगभग 80 लाख से अधिक मास्क का निर्माण करके जरूरतमंदों में वितरित भी किया गया है साथ ही हमने सरकारी और निजी संस्थाओं के बुनियादी जो ढांचे हैं उनका निर्माण करते देश में मौजूदा संस्थानों को उन्नत बनाया है इसी का परिणाम है कि देश भर में स्थित 25,000 से अधिक संस्थानों में युवाओं को कौशल प्रशिक्षण दिया जा रहा है हमने पिछले पाँच वर्षों में 18 राष्ट्रीय कौशल प्रशिक्षण संस्थान खोले 18 कौशल प्रशिक्षण संस्थानों में से आठ संस्थान मात्र केवल महिलाओं को प्रोत्साहन देने के लिए महिला सशक्तिकरण को बढ़ावा देते हुए बनाए गए युवाओं को कौशल युक्त बना बढ़ाने के लिए हर जिले में उनका कौशल बढ़ाने के लिए प्रधानमंत्री कौशल केंद्र खोला गया ताकि युवाओं को आत्मनिर्भर बनाया जा सके साथियों आज स्किल इंडिया मिशन से प्रत्येक वर्ष लगभग एक करोड़ से अधिक युवा जुड़ रहे हैं हमने पिछले पाँच वर्षों में पाँच करोड़ से अधिक युवाओं को कौशलीकृत किया है उनका कौशल विकास किया है इतना ही नहीं हमारी फ्लैगशिप योजना में से एक प्रधानमंत्री कौशल विकास योजना के तहत हमने 9.2 मिलियन से अधिक उम्मीदवारों को विशेष रूप से प्रशिक्षित भी किया है इसके साथ साथ हमने तीन से अधिक नए पाठ्यक्रम भी शुरू किए हैं जो कौशल प्रशिक्षण के अंतर्राष्ट्रीय मानकों को पूरी तरह पूरा करते हैं 
कौशल के लिए आवश्यक उच्च गुणवत्ता को ध्यान में रखते हुए कौशल विकास एवं उद्यमशीलता मंत्रालय ने मुंबई अहमदाबाद के पास गांधीनगर में भारतीय कौशल संस्थान बनाए जाने की घोषणा की और उसकी शुरुआत भी कर दी यह संस्थान के देश के आई एम के कद और प्रतिष्ठा के अनुरूप उच्च स्तरीय होगा साथियों ने सिंगापुर यूएई, जापान कनाडा ऑस्ट्रेलिया जैसे देशों के साथ साझेदारी की है ताकि देश में कुशल कार्यबल के लिए कौशल क्षमता का निर्माण किया जा सके और उद्योगों के अनुसार कुशल कर्मचारियों की मांग को भी पूरा किया जा सके साथियों अंतर्राष्ट्रीय प्रवासी आबादी की मदद करने के लिए हमने वंदे भारत मिशन के तहत लौटने वाले नागरिकों की स्किल मैपिंग करने के लिए स्वदेश स्किल वर्कर्स अराइवल डेटा बेस फॉर एम्प्लॉयमेंट सपोर्ट इस नाम से पहल स्वदेश के रूप में की है इस पहल का उद्देश्य योग्य नागरिकों का उनके कौशल अनुभव के आधार पर डेटा बेस तैयार करके भारत के अंदर और विदेशी कंपनियों की भी मांग को पूरा करना इसके अलावा हमने असीम पोर्टल की शुरुआत की है हाल ही में इसके द्वारा हम श्रमिकों को उद्योगों में बढ़ रही कौशल गैप के अनुसार कौशल बना कुशल बना रहे हैं ताकि उन्हें आसानी से रोजगार मिल सके और नियोक्ताओं को कुशल श्रमिक भी मिल सके इस पहल के द्वारा हम पहले ही छह राज्यों के 116 जिलों में स्किल मैपिंग कर चुके हैं साथियों एन के जरिए ई स्किल इंडिया नाम से एक बहुभाषी ई लर्निंग एग्रीगेटर पोर्टल बनाया गया है जो भारतीय युवाओं को ई स्किल इंडिया अवसर प्रदान करता है ई स्किल इंडिया पोर्टल के द्वारा युवा कभी भी कहीं भी कौशल के अवसर सीख सकता है और राष्ट्रीय कौशल प्रशिक्षण संस्थानों में जो है हम एन कहते हैं नए युग के पाठ्यक्रमों का शामिल किया गया है इसमें इंटरनेट ऑफ थिंग्स स्मार्ट हेल्थ केयर इंटरनेट ऑफ थिंग्स स्मार्ट सिटी थ्री डी प्रिंटिंग ड्रोन पायलट सोलर टेक्नीशियन जियो इन्फॉर्मेटिक्स जैसे कई अन्य पाठ्यक्रम शामिल है इसके बदौलत ही दुनिया के सबसे अग्रिम कार्यबल में भारतीय कार्यबल को जगह मिलेगी मैं आप सभी स्टेक होल्डर्स और उद्योग भागीदारों से स्किल इंडिया मिशन को आगे बढ़ाने एवं जन जन तक पहुँचाने के लिए अपना आग्रह करता हूँ हमारा अब सभी का एक ही प्रयास होना चाहिए कि देश का हर युवा आत्मनिर्भर हो साथियों मैं आप सभी को विश्वास दिलाता हूं कि हम किसी भी मुद्दे को हल करने के लिए दिन संकल्पित हैं हम अपने प्रयासों से आत्मनिर्भर भारत के विजन को साकार कर सकते हैं और भारत को विश्व की कौशल राजधानी बनाने के श्री नरेंद्र मोदी के सपने को पूरी तरह साकार करते हुए भारत को विश्व की कौशल राजधानी अवश्य बना सकते हैं मुझे यकीन है नए मॉडल और बेहतर प्रयासों के साथ हम एक नए भारत का निर्माण करने में सक्षम होंगे आप सभी को एक बार पुनः नमस्कार के साथ जय हिंद थैंक यू मिस्टर ऑनरेबल मिनिस्टर फॉर शेयरिंग योर थॉट्स एंड प्लान फॉर making india truly the skills capital of the world uh thank you uh, the team for helping us uh, manage this uh we're moving on uh, to a very very interesting panel discussion uh three eminent folks who have been deeply engaged interested and vested uh, in a variety of uh, ways on ensuring that we are able to reap the demographic dividend of india uh it's my pleasure to welcome the moderator for today uh, abha torat shah executive director for social finance at uh, british asian trust uh for her to introduce the panelist and kick off over to you abha good morning from london to you shri ram manish and geeta and everyone listening in and a very very happy independence day uh on this day of independence uh, i am absolutely delighted to be talking about the topic that enables several young people and others in our country to acquire those skills and talents to make them independent both financial autonomy and decision making and what better what better partners could i have on this than two friends as well as colleagues manish and geeta i'm going to introduce the two of you and uh, i'm going to tell everybody listening that when i spoke to both of you the main thing you wanted was the key takeaway for everyone was to be practical 
for them to understand what we are doing in skilling, but also for them to understand what the opportunities for partnership with both your organizations and your visions are. And that's the spirit with which I'm going to embrace this discussion. And I hope everyone listening can take away a few key places where both Manish and Gita see there's something that can be done together because the problem is much bigger than the organizations that are at, at the job. Um, so Manish, first to you. Uh, Manish is the Managing Director and Chief Executive uh, of the National Skills Development Corporation. And during his tenure there, he has been looking at how to improve the quality of private sector delivery of skills. He's uh, also from the, from the World Bank and of course, part of our Indian Administrative Services as well. Welcome Manish. Uh, Geeta, uh, a friend and colleague for many years, country director of the, of the Michael and Susan Dell Foundation, key players in education as well as the livelihood space. And their foundation has funded many stellar organizations in the livelihood space, including LabourNet, Blowhorn, DRF, WorkX, Magic Bus, and several others. Um, on this, the topic of our discussion, as you know, is making India the skill capital of the world. Very, very big claim and a tall one. And as I understand, 70 million additional individuals of working age are coming into our workforce every single year. And by 2023, uh, you know, that's the level, number of people we're expecting in the work phase. With that, what is your vision, Manisha? I'm going to start with you. Position India as the skilling hub in the world, and where are we going to take it from? Yeah, thank you so much, um, uh, Abba. I think when we look at um, uh, the vision, I think there, there will be several parts to it. Uh, India is a big country, and uh, while we are a country, we are also a continent. 1.3 billion is the population of the whole of African continent, in a way. So when we get on to talking about skilling, uh, the whole range at, on which we are operating, we need to understand that. Uh, also, the uh, I think uh, uh, the fact that at some in some of the sectors we are leading and we are actually quite doing quite well. In others, we need to do much more. I think that realization is also important. So if you look at the NSDC, we operate through sector skill councils, which are led by industry leaders. And each of these um, uh, councils uh, actually have an insight to their respective industries. So it's healthcare, IT, ITS, retail, gems and jewelry, so various kinds, and each of them contributing differently to the industry. Um, I think when we look at a vision, uh, when we look at IT, ITS, I think we are quite ahead. And globally, if you look at you know, some of the leaders, some of the the leaders um, in, in the world in IT is, is people who have been educated in India, whether it is Google, whether it is Microsoft. I mean, this is Indians who lead it. Uh, so therefore, we need to acknowledge this fact that India's system has led to skilled people actually leading global companies at this point of time, but that's in certain sectors. And there are other sectors where we need to do far much more, uh, perhaps sectors that we have called in the past less aspirational because of, I think, our intrinsic, uh, let's say, uh, I think traditionally, if you look at it, we have, we have been very good at skills. Go back to the Ajanta Kiv, Vilora Kiv, or you go back to any point of history, you'll find Indians are very, very skilled people. But I think at some point we lost to, to regular academics I think confused between the two and the fact that they are conjoined and that you should not separate the two, that's that's something which we have lost. And uh, now with the new education policy coming in, you'll find that this, this is again being emphasized. And globally too, with the digital uh, changes that's coming across sectors, I think the need for uh, skilling in the sense that you must become relevant to the global market, you must be relevant to the domestic market, that as a knowledge has come about. So, so I guess both from education policy side um, as well as uh, the sector leaders you know, who are influencing the whole skill agenda. From every perspective, I think we are leading, we are moving to our skills uh, with focus on quality and focused on industry. Um, so in a way, starting very early uh, in, in your full, the value chain, right from schools, and then looking at uh, always the end customer, which is going to be the employer. So how is it that the employer gets out of you? So that's, that's I think, you know, the the vision where you are able to connect from, from one end to the furthest end and make sure that uh, the whole um, pathway of learning continues through your life. So it's like lifelong learning rather than one sort skilling and end of it all. So that's where we are moving. Excellent. Thank you, Manish, for setting the context, the historical background of skilling and perhaps the disjoint between education and skilling that came some way and it's now going to be readdressed. Gita, let's add your vision to that as a foundation and as an individual, and perhaps as a woman as well. Uh, 
Yeah, no, I'll come to the woman part later. <laughs> but uh, coming to, yes, uh, I think from the foundation and our perspective, uh, just to add to what Manish says, uh, I think India is definitely poised to be the next skill capital. I think all the, you know, the, the right moves and the steps are being taken uh, in the right direction. Uh, in fact, you know, today as I was thinking about it and I said, you know, if, if we were to really make it big and if we were to establish India in the global marketplace, uh, I think we have all factors going for us. So if you look at land, labor, capital, entrepreneur, uh, you know, the land is our, what, 500, actually 700, 800 million workforce, uh, you know, people who can be in the workforce, the participation is half. Uh, uh, I mean, I think the labor is really the willingness and the aspiration. I really think one good thing going for India is that our youth, our population is aspirational. So, you know, the hope isn't given up. So, uh, plus the ability to make the effort to reach your aspirations. So I think that's there. Uh, capital, the government is a significant source of capital for this. Uh, and, you know, uh, the whole push behind Atmanirbhar Bharat, Skill India, all are, again, uh, significant investments going in. Uh, but also private capital is coming in. So I think to Manisha's point, skilling India is not just the skill India mission, it's the entire education spend, you know, whether from the government or the private sector, it's the higher education spend. Uh, so we do have a, a significant size of the industry from a capital base. Of course, it can increase. Uh, but really, I think what is missing and where we can step up is the entrepreneur. Uh, you know, uh, I think skill India has to move beyond the government into the private sector, into the, you know, into the hands of the entrepreneur. If we look at our software revolution, our telecom revolution, our data revolution, government has been a very strong enabler of it. Uh, but really, the leapfrogging has come when the private sector and the entrepreneurs have stepped in. So, so I think the mindset shift from being a service provider and a training provider to being an entrepreneur uh, is one thing that we should now focus on. And I think the time is right. Excellent, Manish. Do you want to respond to that? Government's given the push. We should take the pull. Yeah, I think um, if you look at it uh, globally, a skill is a case of market failure, usually. I mean, uh, the private sector doesn't skill people because as a firm, if I skill someone and that knowledge becomes public, then my competitor is likely to take that away, that pose that person away. So that's the reason why globally government has always stepped in to, to skill. But uh, that's not true when uh, something grows exponentially. So if you look at IT, ITS sector, and when it began to grow in a massive way in late, uh, let's say, turn of the century, then you would have noticed that each of them actually opened their own training centers. You had Aptek, you had, you had various kind of, uh, Bipra had his own training centers, who had Infosys and various others. So I think, uh, in part, this is a combination which requires government to step in and actually lay the way. Uh, but private sector has to come in at some point and, uh, you know, as it begins to flow, uh, take, take that direction upward. So it's a combination which works. And... Um, it's not either or, it's actually a case of a market failure where therefore government first has to come in, create that confidence, and then the private sector takes over. So I think it's the second phase that we're entering into now. Excellent. Um, so as we talk about market failure being readdressed, government taking leadership, uh, we have several partners on this, on this, uh, on our audiences, and I'd love for you both to tell us, tell the part, tell those partners what opportunities are there, some practical ones, Manisha and Geeta. If all of them can reach out to you and work with you, uh, both industry partners, foundation partners, and all others as well. Manish, do you want to go first? Okay, sure. <laughs> yeah, I was waiting for you to uh, decide who you want uh, to go first. So, okay, so for me, I mean, uh, partnership, we, we have almost 650 different private partners as of now who run about 10,000 center for us across India. And we skill about 5 million people every year to, to, the, to these partners. Um, when we look at opportunities, actually endless in terms of uh, how, how would you like to do business? Uh, you, could, you could focus on a particular sector or you could be multi-sectoral. And we have capacity for helping in all of them. Uh, our sector skill councils over time has created a very strong, I would say, qualification packs and national occupation standards, uh, which implies, and there are about 2,400 plus uh, that we have created over time on 36 or 37 different sectors. So if you are training a, a mass in, in Nagaland and you're training a mass in Kerala, there's a kind of standardization of what are the competencies that we're going to impart. So these are knowledge which we could share with you. And uh, 
there are different types of partnership that we engage into. One could be purely knowledge based, that uh, you want to just exchange knowledge, and we we have done that with uh, foreign countries too. Uh, for example, we are deeply associated with Singapore on that. We take knowledge from there. Uh, but you could actually think about investing, and we we help people to channelize the investment in in ways that uh, you gain. Uh, there could be investments of the types which, which for example partners from Japan make. So therefore, there is a need for technical intern, under technical internship training program, specific type of skills in Japan. And uh, we ensure that quality people of that type get skilled here uh, through institutions that we know, and you could uh, create partnership with them. And then uh, they, they go out to work for Japan for maybe three years as interns. Uh, similar kind of partnership we are evolving with uh, UAE. Uh, we have 513 partners uh, who operate globally, uh, and they, they send almost 40,000 blue-collar workers across the world, now, including some of them in very high-tech things, you know, which could be related to construction, could be uh, oil and gas, uh, related job roles. Uh, so any of these sectors which, uh, which might be of interest, uh, you would find that we'll have partner who actually excels in that, and, and therefore we can create connections between the two. Um, so I think this is the... the, the uh, opportunities are manifold, and we now lately are working on edutech, or uh, we will call it skill tech. So we are realizing the digital power of skilling. The fact that the entire skilling cannot be done online, but quite a bit can be. So wherever it is possible, uh, we want to encourage people to come in and uh, use tech for skilling uh, to the extent it is possible. And then, of course, it's an issue of psychomotor skill also, which will require people to work on soft floor, and we understand that, but we can make that connection with the industry. A part of it is done online, and then the other part is done uh, on the ground. And as you saw, Honorable Minister also spoke about eSkill India platform, where we have more than uh, actually 400 courses which are free of cost. They are in nine different languages. India has many languages, and therefore we adapt to the context of India. Uh, and, uh, uh, and therefore, depending upon how ambitious you are, we will be able to set, show you a path which actually suits your ambition as well as you know, your, your eagerness to uh, deliver in, a, in at scale. So I think we are people who can help you deliver at scale, uh, and reach out to people at scale, and also ensure that your eyes are firmly on quality. So scale and quality, Gita. Let's add to that from the MSDF perspective. Yes. Uh, yeah. And the foundation is very small compared to you know NSDC or MSDE. But I would say again, you know, I think the way we see our work is more of a catalyst. Uh, so partnerships are encouraged uh, either on the funding side, you know, as debt providers, impact capital providers, private capital providers, uh, on impact linked financing side, and we can, you know, talk about it later. Uh, but I would say really the way we are looking at our work going forward is, is in three stages. Uh, the first, and, and they all start almost together, but they end at different points of time. Uh, the first one, I would say, is the catch-up phase, uh, which really is, you know, given we are in COVID times, I mean, some of our partners have actually, you know, taken the opportunity to say, how do we train healthcare workers? How do we train, you know, sanitization workers? Those, the demand for those skills is really picking up. Uh, so whether it's a labor net or an Avigna, which has set up a certification platform. Uh, so really saying, let's, create an opportunity which serves a target segment in this segment. So, so I would say that's the catch-up phase. And, and the part two of the catch-up is really, uh, I think, the skill portals that uh, Dr. Pandey also referred to, Manish also referred to. So, you know, whether it's the state governments doing it, the Niti Aayog doing it, or some of the private sector players doing it. So we are investors in WorkEx. And, you know, I think over the last one year, we've realized just how simple and low cost it is to create the matches. Uh, and especially now when labor has relocated and you know the sector demand preferences are changing, just the importance of having that information and matching skill sets becomes more important. So, so that's catch up. Uh, I mean, we are definitely interested in that phase. I see quick outcomes, low hanging fruit, high return on investment there. Uh, the second phase I would say is leverage. Uh, again, going back to Dr. Pandey's point, I think India, you know, and the technology and the data access that we have today uh, is, is actually way better than we were a few years ago, way better than several other countries. Uh, so using that for e-skilling, for blended learning, for more cost-effective, high-quality training, 
I think uh, again, several pilots have shown that you know proctored online learning can actually give you much better results at a lower cost. Uh, so I think leveraging technology like that, leveraging technology to your point, Abha, about you know making India the skill hub globally. Uh, so we have partners like iMerit, which are actually able to, you know, train underprivileged girls from a small slum in Mithya Pradesh in Calcutta and train them to do, you know, or actually be the input for high quality AI and ML done by Uber, Bloomberg, you know, the best of the names in the world. Uh, and the way they are able to do that is, again, using the technology platform and being able to microtask. So, so you know, just you, leveraging technology to match the skill sets we have to the requirements of the globe and actually you know, getting that match is important. Uh, the other piece we have very strongly to leverage on to Manisha's point is the ITIs. India traditionally has been very strong in technical training. Uh, so again, we have the infrastructure, we have I think more than 15,000 ITIs, more than 5,000 engineering colleges. Uh, but today more than 70% of that youth is unemployed. So how do we draw the industry linkages, you know, the dual system of training, apprentices? Uh, again, I think these are pushes which the government is also making. So global partners which want to come and help in that journey. Uh, you know, I think those are areas we are also working in. So, so definitely would like to partner. And quickly on the third is leapfrog, uh, where I feel, you know, I mean, I think we have to emerge as the masters of a few sectors. So in the past, it was software. You know, I think today it can be coding, it can be healthcare. So, uh, I mean, we are picking up three sectors, construction, healthcare, and coding for our focus. Uh, and really say, how do we develop India as the global expert and the global skilling hub in these spaces? Uh, and, and these are long-term journeys. You know, there'll be small steps, uh, high, heavy investment steps, but, but really do that in a focused way. Uh, and the... Second is, I think, leveraging uh, or leapfrogging from our education system to transform, you know, schools to employability uh, journeys. Uh, so again, I think that's that's the right time to engage on how we, you know, stop that distinction between professional education and vocational education. You know, how do we make skilling more aspirational? I think those are the journeys. And again, small steps are being taken taken by us in different states. Uh, so willing to partner there, either as, you know, training providers, entrepreneurs, co-funders, lead funders in whichever way. Uh, of course, the focus for us always has been impact. Uh, so, you know, making sure that uh, these are outcome-based uh, projects. Uh, so, yes, catch up, leverage, and lead from uh, three, all three to start at the same time and I guess end at different points of time. Wow. Excellent. So you've got scale and quality that government's willing to give you the assurance for partnership and the ability to work anywhere in our country with any profile of person who wants to be skilled and wants a job. On the other hand, you've got Geeta who's saying, right, let's get specific. Let's talk about construction, healthcare coding. So the audience has some specific areas of need as well. I'm going to turn one last question to the two of you before I take audience questions, which is what do young people, what do women and girls want? Um, perhaps, Manish, you can tell us what young people want because you talk about human-centric design to us. Um, and perhaps, Geeta, you can talk about point on women and girls. So let's put our person we are trying to serve in the middle of this conversation before we turn over to our audience. Yeah, so uh, I think uh, uh, the way people look at um, job now and the way they look at the future is very different from maybe one generation back. Uh, first thing which I noticed is a lot of people actually doing skilling, but uh, with with the intention that they don't want to jump immediately to a job. It's like one step of learning and they want to go to another before they take a full plunge into jobs. Uh, so what we notice that if you look, if you divide India in terms of income in different age bands, so let's say we look at the total cumulative income of every person who is in the age group of 15 to 20 and add that up. Similarly, age group of 21 to 30, 31 to 40, 41 to 50, 51 to 60. So we add that up. Something strange we found is that the highest amount of income cumulatively is in the age group of 41 to 50. And it's the children of these, uh, these people who actually are currently in the 20s. And uh, 
or, or maybe in the teens, and they are the ones who actually uh, defer decision to get into jobs because I think people have become more choosy. Uh, they, they want to make sure that they're getting into a job is they really like. Earlier, I think when uh, India was perhaps poorer, uh, you, you hardly had much choice. I mean, you, you got into a job, otherwise you were in, in fear of uh, your, your future. That's not the case now. And therefore, the, the children are much more selective. They're much more, I think, careful. Uh, so the need for high level of counseling is important. Uh, the reason I say that is I've often found youth, for example, choosing healthcare because a letter actually is going out of it. And when we talk to them that, why did you choose that? I mean, you spent quite a bit of your time and then you, you couldn't actually last in that job for very long. And the answer was that, uh, well, it pays very well. And I thought maybe that's the job for me because it pays well, but I couldn't really stand uh, the sight of so many sick people, so I had to leave. So essentially we realized that we need a bit of psychometric test to check whether the empathy level of a person who is getting into a healthcare job role is high enough that he should get into, a job, into that job role. So we now advise many young, young people who want to get into healthcare that please do your psychometric and check whether your empathy level is high enough to survive that kind of environment, or otherwise you might have to choose something different. So I think people are getting more nuanced about jobs that they want, and we need to be much more nuanced on how we advise what is it which is good for you. So this is one part of it. I think my worry is also is something which Gita will speak more, but I, I just want to leave a bit of thought on that, is the, is the fact that a large number of women actually drop out from workforce in India, and uh, we are at 23%, but within India, there is a huge range. So there is Himachal Pradesh, Himachal Pradesh with, with 52% equal to that of US, and you have Chhattisgarh also in 42, 43, and the Andhra Pradesh is very high, but we have at the other end, uh, Bihar, which is at 4%, which is lower than the world's average of 5%. The lowest in the world is Yemen, which is at 5%. So, so I think there is a need for doing something, especially on that. And I see the potential of doing something specific for women level force participation increase using the digital platforms uh, because that has the ability to reach into homes without challenging social systems and then skilling people and also providing jobs through digital platforms so that you economically empower women before you, you, uh, you know, talk about social empowerment, uh, which uh, perhaps is a much more complex task. Uh, so I just want to leave that thought and over to you, Gita. Yes, Manish, I think the fact that we are the ninth lowest in uh, women labor force participation is actually, I mean, I think uh, something we, we should definitely address. Uh, and, and it's, you know, it's interesting uh, when we think about the entire working population of, I don't know, the number ranges from 400 to 465 million. Uh, and this is all pre-COVID, of course, in the last few months, uh, it keeps changing. Uh, but I was thinking, you know, for us, the rounding off is 65 million, which is almost what the population of a Germany or a France. <laughs> uh, but, but I mean, that whole five, whatever, 465 million people is broken up into several different segments and, you know, male, women, rural, urban, and, and each come with their own set of aspirations. Uh, so, in fact, we had recently, and of course, a lot of the work that we've done is only with the low income uh, population. Um, so we had recently done a survey of informal sector gig economy workers. Uh, and it was interesting to find out that, uh, you know, when there was a, when a person was not the only breadwinner in the family, uh, the need for flexibility was much higher, you know, much higher rated that as compared with the need for job security or salary. Uh, and in most cases, uh, they were women. So I think as yes, to Manisha's uh, point, these gig platforms are definitely giving a way for women to re-engage with uh, working in you know, on terms that are much more flexible, on terms that are, uh, you know, allow remote working or working from the office, whatever, you know, or flexible working. Uh, so, so definitely uh, those help. Uh, I guess the, the challenge is the more gig or, you know, freelance work you support, the, the further away you're moving from job security and social security. And I think that is also a question that has come up several times. Uh, and, and again, I would just take the example of a survey we had done last year, similar age group of youth in Haryana versus Mumbai and Hyderabad. Uh, I think the Haryana youth 
70 percent wanted to join the government. The job security of the government was extremely important. Uh, whereas in Mumbai and Hyderabad, uh, for the first time, I actually saw 43 percent wanted to join a high-paying private sector job versus a government job. Uh, now, you know, and I think that is, uh, I really think this must be the segment of, you know, the, the students whose, whose parents have been working, you know, which are in the second generation of learning. Uh, but, but I think those differences point to the fact that different states, different, you know, urban, rural, different demographics obviously need different uh, solutions. Uh, formal sector, you know, professional education or even professional skilling is, is one way of getting there. But we do need to also ensure that this segment continues to, you know, value the work in the MSME space because more than 80% of our working force is there. Uh, and how do we ensure that social security or, you know, some form of security insurance continues to get to this segment without putting the owners on the MSME employer? Because if we start doing that, then we disrupt the economics. Uh, so I think just finding a way for the informal sector to continue, the formal sector to continue, and for the youth aspirations to be met uh, in a way that you know we are not forced to make choices of one or the other, uh, I would say is the other aspect. Excellent. I'm going to turn over to questions. And uh, while we've talked about the opportunity as well as the, the work that has happened, I think Sriram has a question here, which actually talks about the challenges, which is a good one to think about now. And his question is, what are your views on aligning on a common vocabulary and a currency of success between civil society, government, skilling providers, industry? Um, and, and the absence of that, are we sort of at a place where, where the problem is huge and there is a misalignment of goals? What, do you, what are both your, both your thoughts on that? I think it's a very important uh, issue because if you look at the initial discussion about what should be the goal of skilling, it was the word used was employability. Um, but uh, I, I don't think so. Employability is that easily measurable. So it obviously turns it turned towards employment. Now employment is not something which skilling alone uh, can create. I mean that's that's a combination of factors. It's the economy it could be a global economy, which is moving how much employment re really occurs. And I think when you get into employment too, then it comes to the same thing which Gita is talking about. That uh, are you into informal employment? Or are you into formal employment? And the, the measures for these two are different. And if you push too hard towards formal, uh, and then the informal suffers, then there is an impact on the economy. So I think it's a very, I think it's a, it's a nuanced issue and uh, requires a matrix which uh, is acceptable to all. Now, with a clear idea that you need to progress over time, uh, that if you to push too hard at either end, it can lead to difficulties and rupture. Uh, so important issue to deliberate for sure uh, between the government, you know, the civil society, and the industry too. Gita, anything to add there? So oh, Manish have, has captured it well. I captured it. I was going to say the same. Um, I have one last question, and, and this is about stigmatization of roles, which I think is a really critical part of vocational training as a sector. I think we as Indians, and I, I would put my hand up to that as well, think that a, a BA or a master's uh, an academic piece of learning is more critical than a vocational education. How does one leave a value system within this space that takes dignity of labor right to the center? Because perhaps by addressing dignity, you might be doing a lot more than just, just doing that. What, what are your views on how one does that? And how does that become a central part of how we look forward to this conversation? Yeah, I could start and uh, I'm sure Mani should add. Uh, I mean, yes, so I think that is the most difficult challenge because it's a cultural and a societal challenge and, you know, not one that can actually be fixed top down. Uh, but, uh, but I think a few, uh, you know, role models or a few examples I would share. One is, uh, I think different types of skilling education for everybody in the school is extremely important. Uh, so, so in fact, you know, I was visiting one of our... Uh, uh, organizations lend a hand. Uh, and, and really, I mean, I think the way they were saying is it's not that you're doing carpentry to become a carpenter. You could be doing carpentry so that you become a good interior decorator. So, you know, I mean, or, or you become the best, world's best carpenter. Uh, similarly, you know, is it tailoring or is it fashion designing? So, I mean, they're, they're all different nuances. Uh, but I think exposing all children uh, towards the different skills is good because you know, once you do it, feel it, you not only learn about it, but I think the stigmatization goes away. 
so so that's one uh, i do think uh, and again uh, manish referred to it uh, you know offering more vocational and then then becoming mainstream in education towards higher education is the other way uh, because today literally like if anybody drops out of school or doesn't have an undergrad degree uh, you know i think that's where the value judgment comes on but can you have system of credit so that whether i'm doing a degree in accounting or i'm do, doing a degree in masonry you know at least they're both degrees and it's not like this is a diploma or uh, so so yes i think those are uh, ways with within the current system that we could try and address it uh, besides of course showing role models you know showing our carpenters going to the middle east uh, you know becoming role models uh, earning a lot so so i do think on the technical side uh, if we are really able to make india the global hub and you know allow people to earn a lot in different countries uh, i think that uh, is the other way but but this is a tough challenge and uh, and i think we really need all hands on deck to be able to do it great a minute left manish yours as a the closing comments on dignity for us as we close yeah i think uh, uh, what i feel is that you require a google map equivalent for skill competencies so that you might actually be a carpenter but there would be certain competencies that you have and just as if you're driving from gurgaon to cannot place you can see road on either side so you know that this is the road you have to take to reach to cannot place but you could turn on left at some point and go to another destination if you so choose similarly a carpenter if he knows his competencies you are able to map it out very well could actually turn towards retail at some point of life and uh, will know that okay i have five competencies which matches that you know so i think once you create those kind of maps and people can actually travel around different job roles depending upon you know their situation in life it will make things much easier at the moment we we i think you know create a very rigid lines and then that makes things difficult and so breaking down into competencies which enable people to become mobile uh, that's something which we are working on at the moment great thank you very much manish and geeta we ended with that that durga like feeling of a competent woman in my head who has many skills and does many roles and sri ram hopefully with that brought humanity to that discussion on skilling to you back to you thank you thank you so much abha for facilitating this discussion and thank you so much manish and thank you geeta for taking the time out to join us and providing your insights um definitely while the problem is very large deep and complex uh we're confident that we will be able to work together towards a more constructive solution in the years to come thank you